listening to a podcast from digitaloilandgas.com. This podcast is entitled Digital Blockers, Barriers, and Solutions. The IEA recently asked me about what I saw as the key blockers and barriers to the digitalization of the oil and gas industry. Well, here's my with thinking on the topic. And of course, this article could be valuable for anyone thinking of selling digital solutions to an oil and gas company and needing answers to the objections that will inevitably get posed. Let's begin with the big one, the brownfield challenge. Brownfield oil and gas infrastructure, that is field assets, pipeline compression plants, gas plants, refineries, upgraders, is already installed and operating compared to greenfield or brand new and still on the drawing board facilities. It's way easier and cheaper to make digital changes to greenfield infrastructure because the changes are basically to a paper design. A brownfield plant may be energized, that is, high voltage is flowing through it or it's heated or it's pressurized or it's rotating with its pumps uh, being active, which means it has to be switched off, cooled down, drained, and devaporized before work can be done on it, including making digital changes. Shutdowns like this don't happen on a frequent basis. They can take a year to plan and maybe even years apart. It can be impossible or at the very least impractical to even test a digital adaptation on a live and running plant. So for digital innovation to experience uptake in brownfield settings, it must demonstrate a sensitivity to the challenges of brownfield plant operations and the difficulties of introducing change into live environments. Second big barrier is the industrial climate. Considering the brownfield problem, imagine how hard implementing change must be in an industrial setting. Needless to say, change happens cautiously, for which we're all actually grateful. Plant managers, supervisors, and staff are highly motivated and rewarded on such measures as zero safety incidents, high reliability, predictable cost, and high quality. Employee turnover in plants is usually very low creating a stable workforce, but in many instances, a strong aversion to process change that either create perceived or real risks. The usual approach to digital innovation, that is prototype, fail quickly and iterate, works best in a dynamic, agile, adaptable, and flexible work climate and culture. In other words, the opposite of what you'd find in the standard industrial setting. So for digital innovation to succeed, it needs to introduce change slowly and patiently with the same easy-to-use adoption curve as the best digital innovations anywhere, all while protecting the key performance measures. Third key barrier is what I call engineering bias. I sense that the engineers in oil and gas tend to view what we think of as digital, that is consumer technology, as being in the realm of toys and just not robust enough for industrial use, where the environment and lives are at risk. Remember the blue screen of death, that curious way that Windows systems can simply freeze on you for no reason? There's no place for this system behavior in an industrial setting. What if, just when you need to cycle a valve to address a pressure event in a gas plant, the system just shuts down or freezes, or the rotating hourglass starts a perpetual loop? Acceptable digital technologies are those that demonstrate a level of robustness consistent with industrial standards and expectations. Next big barrier is, in fact, the incumbent technology designs. Many of the key industrial-grade automation technologies for oil and gas infrastructure were not designed to be open in the same sense as open systems that allow interoperability between different supplier technologies. In fact, given the risks involved, it actually makes sense to be not open so that more control can be exercised over the performance of the technology. Industrial kit, such as programmable logic controllers or PLCs or SCADA systems, simply lack convenient or easy ways to allow integration with other technologies, including digital solutions. And then there's the question of the system's architecture to consider. Say a pump is connected to a PLC that controls the pump's actions. The pump's various sensors feed a steady and high volume of data to the PLC, that is, temperature, rotating speed, pressure, voltage, and throughput. There's little benefit to moving this data beyond the point where it's generated. Engineers ask what, if any, of the torrent of data should move beyond the PLC to some other system for, say, analytics, reporting, or monitoring. Where and how should a digital solution plug in to this data flow? This is a key systems architectural question that bedevils plant designers. They need to consider all of the equipment in plant, the PLCs and their limitations, the thousands of possible sensors, the bazillion data points that the sensors generate, 
and the need to monitor or supervise the whole lot from inside the plant, in the plant control room, in the maintenance department, in production, and of course, in the head office. Good digital technologies consider their data generation and data consumption needs and how best to fit into the architectures in place. Next big barrier is cybersecurity. Unlike commercial systems like ERP that have been plugged into the internet since the 90s, most plant systems are closed and not linked to the internet. They lack the kinds of cyber monitoring or industrial design thinking that keeps hackers at bay. We can see this phenomenon play out in the frequent news stories about industrial equipment and sabotage and even consumer technology gone awry because of cyber problems. Considering that most industrial plants were not intended to be connected to the internet, indeed many predate the internet, and suffer from the brownfield problem I've discussed earlier, the only practical solution is to prohibit the introduction of uncertain technologies into the plant setting. That usually means no cell phones in plants, no internet connection, no cameras, and soon probably no toasters in the lunchroom. Digital solutions that meet the highest standards for cybersecurity may be more welcome. Next is intrinsic safety. One of the hazards of industrial settings is the possible presence of flammable or explosive vapors, some of which are invisible and hard to detect. These vapors may only need a single spark from some electrical device that's not properly grounded to ignite a fiery conflagration. Most consumer technology falls into this category. That is, it's not intrinsically safe. Intrinsically safe devices are significantly more costly than consumer devices because they have a much smaller market, have low economies of scale in manufacturing, and an impressive feature set. They can be waterproof, bombproof, crushproof, impactproof, and so on. Industrial plants can often produce very high levels of electrical interference, or because of their scale, render mobile networks unstable, unreliable, or simply unavailable. Most plant equipment is therefore hardwired to a physical copper or fiber optic network. Many oil and gas fields are far removed from civilization and won't even have access to a mobile network. Unfortunately, many digital technologies are designed for dense urban settings with good network coverage. Mobile devices that rely on a cloud network connection may not work. Digital technologies need to be intrinsically safe where it's required and must be able to run in the absence of a reliable network connection. And the last but not least, the final barrier is timing and economics. It's pretty tough for a digital innovation to be the best marginal investment in oil and gas. Consider just the simple math of a producer of 100,000 barrels per day. Assume the price of oil moves from $45 to $50, or $5 a barrel. That's an additional $182 million in revenue in a single year with no increase in cost. For most oil and gas companies, the best strategy is not to do anything and simply wait for prices to rise. Effectively, the only time a digital investment would be the best marginal investment is when production costs are well above the recovered price, i.e. the net back is zero or negative, supplier costs have been slashed sufficiently to trigger bankruptcies, capital spend is just keeping the lights on, and the workforce has been trimmed to skeletal levels. In other words, when there's nothing left to do. If digital investments can help lower costs further, or extend the capital dollar, or improve the productivity or safety of the remaining staff and quickly, they will make sense. Fortunately, we're at precisely this moment in the commodity cycle. You have been listening to a podcast from DigitalOilGas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at DigitalOilGas.com.